Numerical Computation, Chapter Seven, Video One. We now look at the fixed point iteration methods to find approximate solutions to linear systems. We'll be considering the following problem. We want to find approximate solution to the system AX equal to B, and in particular, the A matrix has the following properties. First, it's a large system, meaning n is very big. You can say n equals to 1 million, for example. And also, A matrix has a small percentage of non-zero elements. So most of the elements in A are zero, and this is called a sparse matrix. And finally, and very often, but not necessarily, A could be structured meaning that we know exactly where the non-zeros are and what they are. It has a clear structure. And these type of matrix will come very often in the discretization of numerical methods for differential equations, for example. So if we know it's structured, that means if I want to do the computation A times a vector x, that step could be computed very efficiently with little time. So the main idea now will be, instead of trying to compute A inverse, which is expensive, now we perform the cheap operation, that is the multiplication of A with the vector. Let's write out our system into n equations and n unknowns. So this is what we want to solve, the problem we have. The main idea of um, these methods that we'll be talking about are more or less a kind of a fixed point iteration, but in the system setting. Okay. So we'll start with by rewriting the system into an equivalent, a different point, but equivalent. So what we will do will be we would keep all the diagonal terms on the left okay, and move everything else to the right so so everything else moved to the right but in the diagonal turn is missing because I left it on the left and then I would divide it both side by a and n the coefficient in front of the diagonal term so now I have it in the form that is the x vector equals to some vector valued function as a function of x I can also write it in a compact form so for the ith equation, I'll just get this expression and where um, all the other terms, the summation, I put them in the sum, I sum over j equals to 1 to n of aij xj, except the point where j equals to i, and that one I left on the left-hand side. And this goes through all the equations. And now with this in our hand, you can think that the solution for the system here, x, now becomes a fixed point for this vector valued function defined here on the right hand side. And then we can throw in some fixed point iterations, say um, given xk, we put xk on the right hand side and then we compute it and the value returns here becomes xk plus 1. And that is exactly the Jacobi iteration. Okay, now we look at the Jacobi iteration. So you need to have a starting point, an initial vector, x0. We use the upper index to indicate the number of iteration. x0 is a vector, has n components transposed, so it's a column vector. And then we go through iterations k equals to 0, 1, 2, all the way until stop criteria is met. And then we go through each equation, i from 1, 2, 3, all the way to n. And then for each equation, we perform exactly this fixed point iteration algorithm, putting xk on the right-hand side and compute it and return the value into xk plus 1. And then you end your loops. Okay, so two more things to talk about. One is how to choose a reasonable starting point, and another will be what are suitable stop criteria to be used. Okay, let's look at the starting vector. So we haven't talked about unconvergence analysis yet. So 
that this is a linear fixed point iteration. So later on we will learn that if it converges, it converges for any initial guess. So anything goes. Some popular choices are the following. We can just choose some simple um, vector. Let's say all vectors, um, vector with all entries 1 could be or 0. Another choice will be um, just since you created the right hand side vector b, I'll just copy that to be my initial guess. And then there is a, a better choice if your matrix is diagonal dominant. Since the diagonal term is very big, you can think that the left hand side is dominated by the diagonal and then you throw away the rest and then you can solve a diagonal system which gives you trivially this solution for each xi and then you simply use that as your initial choice and that is closer to the solution as um, your random other choices. And stop criteria, there are a couple of them one can use. One would be measuring the distance between the two iterations. Now since these are vectors, and then you have to um, choose a certain vector norm. And any vector norm will do. And second, um, one can define the quantity that we call residual, which is Ax minus b. Note that if Ax minus b equals to zero, then x is a solution. So if x is close to the solution, or xk is close to the solution, then this quantity shall be small. Okay? And since it's a vector, then you have to measure it in certain norm. And also maximum number of iteration that always you should keep. And you can use any combinations of these three. So let's look at this algorithm we have just designed. Thinking of uh, um, from the point of implementation, how would you write the code? You see that in order to compute xk plus 1, we need to have the information of xk all the time until we completely finish the computation. So therefore, in each iteration, I must create memory spaces for two vectors, and one for xk, one for xk plus 1. So xk could be a huge vector, so this does require a little bit more memory space. So it's kind of a drawback. And second, we notice also that the computation for the i-th equation does not depend on the computation for any other equation. So this is actually a non-sequential method, meaning I could compute in any random order of number of equations as long as I cover each equation. It doesn't have to be from 1, 2, 3 all the way to n. Any order will go. So that is great for parallel computing, which is the norm of modern scientific computation. Say I have a huge system with 1 million unknowns and I have 1,000 processors at my disposal. I would cut my problem into 1,000 pieces and send each piece, which now contains 1,000 equations, to a processor and ask them to do simultaneously, and then I just collect the data. Okay, so this is a great advantage of the Jacobi iteration. But however, which we haven't talked about yet, and we will observe it, the Jacobi iteration does converge rather slowly, and one would hope to improve it. Okay, so next time we will look at some method that is based on Jacobi, but we make modifications to improve convergence.